Thanks, Natalie, and uh, thanks, Rob, uh, for, for them leading us today. Uh, Rob, you have led, of course, because I recall seeing you um, at the back of your garden sitting there, <laughs> sometimes in the sun and sometimes not so much um, in the spring. So. On Mother's Day, wasn't it? Wow. I'm getting, I don't know about you, but I get all these, you probably don't, but I get all these emails for ideas for church. So um, the big idea at the moment, of course, is Father's Day, because in America it's Father's Day. Um, so I get all these emails about Father's Day thoughts, but um, I'm not worried about Father's Day. Of course, it is here as you are going. <laughs> well, over the lockdown, an unprecedented event occurred that I would venture to guess has not occurred in the lifetimes of any of us here. What is it you wonder? Well, there were quite a few unprecedented things, weren't there? But um, they shut every church in the country. No, this wasn't some sudden persecution that broke out in the otherwise relaxed, easygoing Aotearoa, New Zealand. But one of a raft of measures to control the spread of COVID-19. And we did it willingly. I'm so thankful, as I'm sure you are, that technology enabled us to keep in touch, to view things um, online, to connect with others through the internet and, of course, the old-fashioned phone. Things didn't always work out perfectly for us, but the fact that we had a service every week, and many of you attended, and others as well, and uh, good to see you, not that I can see you online this afternoon as well, is an amazing thing. Next week, actually, we will reflect on this weird time in, uh, in our recent history with lockdown lessons. We're going to sh- start a, just a short series on lockdown lessons, and we're going to start with a panel of people just sharing uh, some experiences and insights and reflections about that time. And if you're keen to, uh, if you have a story you'd like to share and you're not officially on the panel, let me know. We can share it in some way, you can, you can share it, or maybe we can uh, put it in a written form, or, or something like that. But one thing, hopefully, that we've realised through this period is that church is not a programme, is it? That we can simply switch on and switch off. Church is us, the people of God. If I may use a botanical metaphor, church is a spiritual greenhouse where we can grow and be nurtured together and then send plants to grow other gardens all around the world. As a church, we want to not only survive, we want to thrive. We 
want to thrive. So today we reach the end of this journey uh, with Paul and the Thessalonians that we've been on in the past several weeks. And what a journey it's been. Paul planted this church in Macedonia. And he was delighted with the progress they had made and their love for each other and their faith and their hope in the Lord Jesus. But he wants them to continue to grow and to please God more and more. Over the past couple of Sundays, particularly, we have addressed the question, what happens when Jesus returns? When he kind of winds everything up and history, uh, if you like, enters the, the brand new phase of the kingdom of God. And we've talked about the hope that we have and the fact that as believers we live in this kind of awkward in between, don't we? Between, uh, as I said last week, between the gore and the glory. Not gore and invocable, but gore and the glory. And in this time, we are living in gratitude and wonder and amazement about what Christ has done, dying and rising again, and also the reality that he will um, come again. And those two things uh, motivate us to live to please God. So um, if you wonder what we talked about the last couple of weeks, and we had hope on, uh, on the thing here. No, it wasn't just covering up the cords, but that was a useful thing. Um, but just the hope that we have. In this last section, Paul gives a whole series of instructions, as he often does in his letters. You know, bang, 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 and Peter does the same in his. And I've put them under the heading, thriving together, thriving together. How do we thrive together as the people of God? Well, we thrive together simply put by focusing on others <coughs> and depending on God. Focusing on others and depending on God. Hopefully you will have received an outline, um, a note-taking outline for this message. If you need a pen, um, just grab one. I think I'll leave that. Uh, someone can just um, hand, thank you, Dan, my pen man. So uh, just put up your hand if you'd like a pen. And uh, I've helped with the underline of these phrases just to help you internalize the word, because it's very hard to apply the word if you've forgotten it. You know that um, when someone asks you, what was the sermon about? And you struggle to remember. And that's sometimes when they ask me what it's about, and I struggle to remember. And I, and I preached it. So how, if I forget, how much more might you forget? So this will help you just internalize that. So focusing on the others, leaders. Leaders. Verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. Paul says, acknowledge, recognize, appreciate your leaders. Have you ever grumbled about a leader? Not just a pastor, we've all done that. <laughs> but a leader in general. There's been a lot of grumbling this week, hasn't there? Let's face it, in this nation, with the terrible lockdown, sort of, uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? Lockdown breach, if you like. And our leaders have copped a fair share of blame. To be a leader is no easy task. Paul writes to Timothy, um, Sometime later, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. An overseer here, we might translate as an elder, a shepherd, um, even some, some of the aspects of the role of a deacon looking after the church. And of course, these days we would include ministers and pastors as well, who are paid elders if you like, pay details. Uh, so, this definitely refers to uh, pastors and, and uh, ministers, but not it's not just to Andrew Cox and Reverend Tang. <laughs> it is to those who are involved in leadership in the body of Christ in any way, home group leaders, elders, um, uh, ministry leaders, whatever it might be. A study among Presbyterian uh, ministers um, in 2006 noted that the majority felt overwhelmed by the pressure of their role. You'll notice a handy little underline here if you want to fill that in. Feel free. First underline there. Uh, some of the comments that uh, came through in the study were enormous expectations. I am very weird. Basically, I have to do everything. 
Sometimes the load is so heavy I feel paralyzed. They say, you do it. <laughs> if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. I'm out five nights this week and four next week. I feel I've failed. And various other comments there. Now, at various times in my ministry, and I've been blessed to be in ministry most of my working life in some form or other, I have felt all of those things. And many of them have not have been of my own doing. My own expectations, my own um, difficulty in delegating, my own vision for what, you know, what I want to do and accomplish, and so on. And as leaders of God's people, we not only do a job, we follow a calling. We follow a calling. We want to please God. We want to reach and disciple people. We want to grow the church, impact the city, change the world. We passionately believe that the local church, living and telling the good news, is the hope of the world. Talk about expectations, right? That's a, lo a big load to put on anyone, isn't it? And many of us start with great big goals and lots of enthusiasm, and after a while it turns into less enthusiasm, a willingness to live with the status quo, and a desire for a quiet life and a night in. In the same publication, Anonymous writes his journey of passion and enthusiasm that dwindled in the face of church power blocks that resisted the changes that he is making, that he was seeking to make. He ended up being forced out of the church and becoming disillusioned. This is a very common issue. I love the fact that I've come into the church that's already in this kind of changing, moving mode. It means everything's up for grabs, right? Well, maybe not quite. But there is this sense that, hey, maybe we can flex, maybe we can adapt and praise God for that. Thankfully, that man is actually back pastoring now. You learned a valuable lesson. Nurture your own identity apart from your vocation. Your own identity. Have a life is basically apart from the church. As always, Jesus is the best example of this. Where did Jesus receive his sense of identity, his, um, his happiness, his fulfillment, uh, or whatever? Was it in the ministry that he did, or was it something else? It was not in uh, the approval of people, certainly not his disciples or the crowds. It was in the love of his Father. So his identity was not in how successful his ministry was, but on the fact that he was loved by his father. When his father said to him, uh, when he was baptized of him, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, very similar. This is my son. Listen to him. He's my son. That affirmation from the father fueled Jesus' ministry, so he didn't require the affirmation from the crowds, thank goodness, because they eventually turned on him, didn't they? Um, a leader's greatest encouragement must come from God. When we talk about encouragement for the leader, it must come from God. Not basing our self-worth on, um, on our own uh, efforts or on the appreciation of others, but from God. Now, can the people that we lead be more encouraging? Probably. We often said in our culture that we're not the most encouraging uh, culture in the world, are we? Um, my mentor in student life used to quote from an old commentary in Exodus often. It's a hundred years old or so, but the words are just so, so good. If I allow my work to get between my heart and the master, it will be worthless. We can only effectually serve Christ as we are enjoying it is while the heart dwells upon his person that the hands perform the most acceptable service to his name. None can minister Christ with power and freshness to others if he is not feeding upon Christ for his own soul. Happy is the person who ministers thus, whatever be the reception to their ministry. Should their ministry fail to attract attention or produce apparent results, he has not lost his sweet portion in Christ. But the one who is merely feeding upon the fruits of his ministry or delighting in the gratification and attention which it affords is nothing more than a mere pipe conveying water to others and retaining only rust for itself. This is a sad condition to be in, and yet it is the condition of every servant who is more occupied with their work and its results than the master and his 
good words, timeless words to focus on the master and not just the feedback to the work we do. But encouragement, as I said, does have its place, doesn't it? And here's um, a couple of things that really encourage leaders. The first one is people who are flourishing. People who are flourishing. What do I mean by flourishing? Simply this. They are growing. There is movement in a forward direction. Not only knowledge of God, but the application of that knowledge. This is thrilling to see, isn't it? Like a to toddler taking her first steps. And then, before you know it, you're leading them down the aisle to her new husband. Uh, daughters, if you're watching, this is no hint here. Although, you can take it that way if you like. But they grow, don't they? These little ones, they grow. Can you look back on, on perhaps the year and say, Lord, thank you, Jesus, I'm a little less cranky than I was a year ago, maybe. Perhaps a little more contented. I've still got a long way to go but there is a sense of progress, growth, and flourishing in my life. Secondly, people who follow through, people who follow through, they do what they say they will do. Matthew, uh, I mean, yeah, Matthew records Jesus telling a story of a father who sent two sons into the vineyard. He said to the first son, son, go and check out the vineyard, please, uh, for me. Uh, no, dad. I uh, don't want to do that thing, so I've got um, you know, other things to do, I want to go out with my friends, whatever. But actually he changes his mind and he goes and checks on the vineyard. And he asks the other son, and, and the other son says, sure dad, no problem, I'll, I'll get to it soon. And of course uh, he doesn't go. And Jesus asks the question, which of the sons did what the father wanted? Of course it was the first son, even though it, it wasn't sounding too promising at the beginning. Uh, find my spot here. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, that's the problem when you slightly lean on the, lean on the notes. So people who follow through, those are so encouraging for leaders. Now, obviously, verbal communication is encouraging too. Sometimes a note, um, just a thank you, whatever, is great. If you've been in leadership, it's nice to have that feedback, isn't it? Um, as Mark Twain used to say, I can live for two months on a good compliment. You know what he's saying? Um, it really can help us, um, encourage us, um, feed us in some way. But if you want to really bless those who you have some level of oversight with, if they're flourish, uh, flourish and um, follow through, great things. Paul carries on, live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. There's some great advice here, isn't there? We might describe this kind of as situational leadership. Leadership that's appropriate for the situation and the people that you are ministering to in the way that they need. Remember Paul in chapter 2? We loved you so much. We were like nursing mothers with their children, with you. There was a gentleness. We were so gentle with you. But what does he say to the Galatians um, a couple of years earlier? You foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? So it depends, doesn't it, on the people, on the situation, on how they're going. Oh, to have the wisdom to know what to say to who, when. This is what we need because sometimes we just need a bit of TLC, don't we? What we want to see in the people that we need is people who flourish and then are at the point that they are able to um, look outward to other people in the name of Jesus. But not everyone's at that point. Some people need that TLC and they don't really need a kick in the pants. Other people maybe need more the kick in the pants. I know I need a kick in the pants um, from, uh, from the Holy Spirit and maybe someone else sometimes. <laughs> Not listening, of course. Now, here's a practical idea as we... Uh, the key is being focused on the needs of others, the other person. Here's a practical idea as we gather that you um, are encouraged to try. Ask someone at church, when we gather together, 
What has been the best or worst thing about your last week? That's a good question, eh? It just narrows it down. What's, it gives people some options. Um, what's the best thing? Maybe what's the worst thing? Okay, what about the next week? What's that looking like? Is there anything that I can pray for you about? And then when they say, oh yeah, pray for this, do it right then and there. It doesn't have to be a five minute prayer. A 30 second prayer is totally fine. You know, God answers 30 seconds prayer. He even answered a prayer from, from Peter when he said, Lord, help! And that was less than 30 seconds. So pray for others. Ask them a couple of questions. Pray for them 30 seconds. Certainly you can pray longer. Is a beautiful thing to do. A wonderful way to focus on others as we come to church. Um, maybe think, who's someone I can encourage? Who's someone I can pray for? I remember I was at a conference years ago, fairly new Christian, and uh, it was one of those opportunities which I wasn't super familiar with, but basically involved a lot of people going forward and being prayed for and lots of stuff going on. And uh, I ended up uh, being prayed for, and uh, um, someone asked me to pray for him. And this man's name was Brent Chambers. Now, for those of us who are a little older, might remember the name Brent Chambers. He composed the song, Be Exalted, O God, May Your Glory Be Over All the Earth. Now, he didn't compose those words, it's from Psalm 